Hello, Booktube. You're, you're white-faced and trembling. Your worried parents have been told that the embassy has secured your release. The word is that you're in a convoy on the way to the border. But no. <laughs> no. You're still mine. It's still more time for TBR torture. <laughs> and this time, it's totally gratuitous. <laughs> you already told me everything I want to know. I'm still going to torture your TBRs. This time, with older books. Good Lord, is nothing safe. <laughs> We're going to start with the first book in a an urban post-punk fantasy series that I really like. Uh, this is by Rob Thurman, and it's called Nightlife. The little subtitle there is a Cal Leandros novel because Cal Leandros is a half-supernatural... He's our half-supernatural main protagonist. He's uh, a hottie, <laughs> uh, and he's dangerous, and he lives in a world in New York City that is thoroughly inhabited by supernatural creatures in addition to all of the normal freakazoids that live in New York City. So it's it's urban fantasy. Uh, and it's told in a really headstrong way. The writer really, this author has done many, many, many writing jobs. He knows how to construct a story. He knows how to make it work towards a climax. And after this first book, he, per he certainly knew what his readers were responding to. And it wasn't just Cal Leandros. It was also a character, Cal's cousin, Nico. I wish I was looking to see if he was on the back cover, but he's not. Uh, Cal Leandros is a hottie, and he's a badass, and he's uh, sarcastic, and his cousin is a super hottie, <laughs> and and quickly became a fan favorite for the series. But if you if this series is, it's had six or seven books, and if it somehow missed you, if you somehow missed it, and you like urban fantasy, you should give these a try. <laughs> the, those of you who are pre pre or predisposed. Uh, we'll be fanning yourself with these two hotties in book after book after book. <laughs> uh, so we'll move, we'll move from uh, the ridiculous to the sublime. This next one is by, it's edited by Peter Quenell, who is a, a great scholar. And more to the point, those of you who maybe recognize his name will know that he is a great Byron scholar. And this is a fantastic book that came out from Oxford University Press years and years and years ago. I don't think it's still in print, but if you ever see it at a used bookstore, it is one of... The indispensable books about Byron to have. This is a self-portrait in his own words, a big thick thing edited by Peter Cornell in which he goes through all of Byron's great letters, all kinds of other things, other people's accounts, and meshes them together. It's a phenomenal work of scholarship and a phenomenal work of judgment because you could easily do a book this big that tried to do something like this and misfired. Instead, Cornell has a perfect ear for what delineates a self. So this is the closest that we will ever come to the biography, that by, the autobiography that Byron wrote that his publisher burned. This is the closest that we can ever come. This is every time that Byron has ever revealed anything about himself, come close to revealing something about himself, implied something about himself, and also all of those things done by other people. So if you ever see this book and you're wondering about it, it gets my strongest recommendation. It is amazingly good. Uh, Byron's great company anyway on the page, but but uh, this is sort of a one-stop shop for all of that. Uh, then the next one is a classic. In this case, it's a Penguin classic. It's an orange fine mass market Penguin classic, and I'm, I'm recommending it just because it's TBR torture time, and you're all my playthings. <laughs> and you're going to know the book, of course. It's Daniel Defoe. It's Maul Flanders. Uh, just in case you have ever been, you've ever needed the nudge, uh, this was done, this was written a, a generation before the American Revolution, and it is an amazing book. It, you, you, a lot of people are forced to read it for school, and they read, therefore they come to it too early, and they're, they, since they've got a gun to their head, you, you're, you're in precious little motivation to like anything under those circumstances. That's why I'm always an advocate for just revamping the way schools teach literature. Not colleges, because there you're an adult, and you can be, you can understand that you're going to be presented with something that you might not like at first, and you will, by a combination of patience, perseverance, and instruction, maybe learn to like it. All of us have had that experience in college. I'm, uh, and so college I'm not talking about, but a lot of people are forced to read this in high school, and no one it should be forced to read anything in high school. You should be forced to read, but not a particular book. It should be your choice. You should be responsible for it, and just the whole system should be much more flexible but one way or another a lot of people are introduced to this book involuntarily and that takes the fun out of it this is a fun book it has dark undertones because Daniel Defoe 
He's due for another big biography. He led a remarkable life, utterly remarkable. One of the most remarkable literary figures in Western history. And a huge amount of primary source groundbreaking that's still to be done. He's had a couple of good biographies in the 20th century, but there's a, there's a thousand page biography out there that reconsiders him from the ground up. And no matter what you do, <laughs> I mean, believe it or not, that he could write Mal Flanders or Journal of the Plague Euro, these, these books that we still study centuries later, when you look at the larger scope of Daniel Defoe's life, you get the, in, the distinct impression that he might not have cared much about these things. He tried his hand at everything. Mal Flanders took off. Mal Flanders was a hit. And that made him pay attention. Anything that brought him money made him pay attention. Uh, and so any, this that happens to be the old Penguin English Library with the orange spines. But any opportunity, if you're ever on the fence about reading The Adventures of Maul as she tries to be a good person in a horribly flawed world, uh, if, you're ever, if you haven't read it and you're ever on the fence about it, this TBR torture is designed to push you over and get you to give it a try. Uh, then this next one, uh, is from, I think, the 1950s? This is a classic, 19, yeah, 1958. This is a classic 1958 novel. I believe it's a masterpiece of American literature. Believe it or not, I think it is. It doesn't look like it. I'm going to hold up a, a pulpy mass market paperback with a pulpy cover illustration, and you're going to think, okay, that looks just like the sort of thing that maybe my grandparents would have seen on a spinner rack at the drugstore, and they would have, but that doesn't debar it from being good literature. They, they would have seen plenty of stuff that is studied in school today, on those same spinner racks. This is by Mildred Savage, the uh, the pride of Norwich, Connecticut, and it is Parish. And I know, you're looking at that cover and you're thinking, oh my. <laughs> but uh, a lot of books have had covers like this that ended up being really good. There was scarcely ever a John O'Hara collection of short stories, for instance, that didn't have a cover that looked like this when it came out from mass market paperbacks. When mass market paperbacks started to take off and publishers started to think in mid 20th century, hey, everybody is buying these things. They had units on trains platforms. You, and, and, and there was no yet effective blur between lowbrow and highbrow. It wasn't anymore in the 21st century we think of mass market paperbacks as inherently lowbrow. But it, in, when this experiment was first taking off in big scale, no one thought that. So this is a serious novel. It's about warring tobacco barons. Uh, and a love affair that is kind of a nod to Romeo and Juliet, but also kind of a nod to Rebel Without a Cause, that happens right in the middle. Young people that end up making enemies everywhere. And it is gripping and thoroughly atmospheric. Just thoroughly. Uh, I ignored it for a long time. I came to it late, and boy, oh boy, I am a convert. Uh, Mildred Savage, is, for this book, she is one heck of a writer. I think I read a couple of her other books. They were also very good, but Parrish is clearly the masterpiece that she had inside her. Not every author is courteous enough, like Margaret Mitchell, to write their one masterpiece and then never write anything else. So, so the, in case you're wondering, not that you ever will be, because Mildred Savage will never be reprinted, but in case you see them at a used bookstore and you think, I, was, I, I think I vaguely remember that name, is this the good one? Parrish is the good one. It was made into a movie the movie's not very good. The novel is fantastic. Uh, and, <laughs> again, I want to apologize for the cover. Maybe you can find a paperback cover that doesn't look like that, but I do recommend the book if you ever come across it. It won't be in your libraries anymore. They will long since have deaccessed it. Probably won't be in your used bookstore. It's long since gone, but worth your time if you can find it. Uh, then the next one is an oldie. <laughs> this is an author I have mentioned before in his youth. Oh, book two. In his youth really can't quite see it in the portraits that survive, but in his youth he was a super hottie, even though he had had the smallpox. He had a minor brush of scarring later in his life, but when before that, in his youth, oh my. <laughs> and he was also a genius. This is Philip Sidney. Uh, and the book I'm talking about here, this happens to be the Everyman paperback classic that has uh, Astrophil and Stella, but it also has The Defense of Posey, which is the thing that I'm, that I'm TBR torturing with you today. That is our young author. Uh, and the Defense of Posey is a, a meditation. It'll stick with you. Once you get used to the parlance, once you get used to, to the diction, or maybe you could find um, a reprint that's, that has the English modernized. That's always a good idea because it's, it's superficial. Unlike modernizations of somebody like Chaucer, modernizations of Sydney are really just brushing up diction and spelling. Why let that get in the way? Why let that get in your way of enjoying 
a, what is a masterpiece, a groundbreaking masterpiece of English critical thought. This is Sidney turning his poet and writer's imagination onto the craft of literature and meditating about it for page after page after page. It once was a classic. I don't know that Sidney is classic anymore. I don't think he's canonized anymore. It's a terrible shame. Uh, but, but Defense of Posey will take you all of an hour to read, and it's worth your while. It really is, especially if it's your introduction to this author. Uh, the, his, his poetry, well the, well, the sonnet sequence of Astrophil and Stella is very accessible, I think. And then his longer work, not so much. <laughs> but uh, but that's going to be my Philip Sidney recommendation, is Defense of Posey. It had, once it caught on, once people realized how good it was, it had many, many editions with variations of that title and stuffed with other stuff, either by Sydney or by other people. But I'm sure that someplace, I'm sure there are PDFs of it free all over the internet. I'm sure that, that Project Gutenberg, for instance, has a version that's free. Give it a try and see. If, if it's not in modernized English and that starts to throw you, then by all means, you have, you have a, my papal dispensation to find a modernized English version and just read that. Don't, don't let that get in the way. Uh, and then the last thing I want to do for this totally gratuitous TBR torture is a classic. A lot of you will know it. This is the best edition that I know of, of this classic, by far, hands down. And it's Cape Cod by Henry David Thoreau. His, this, this edition contains not only his long, his long essay on Cape Cod, its moods, its people, fundamental Cape Cod reading. Those of you who have ever been to Cape Cod, every used bookstore, every library will have multiple editions of Thoreau on Cape Cod. It's a wonderful, it's one of America's greatest writers in one of the, one of the America's greatest thought meditations about location. One of the, one of the greatest location meditations that any American has ever written. Uh, and this particular edition has an introduction by Henry Beston, who also did one of the greatest meditations on Cape Cod ever done, The Outermost House. And so pairing the two of them was just a perfect idea. And it also has illustrations by the great Henry Bugby Keane, uh, who does not only line illustrations, little ones, like that, little, a little, but also big full page illustrations. There you go. There are birds, black and white, with waves in the background, crashing in foam. Uh, I have mentioned on this channel many times, oh, there's another one, look at that, how lovely. Uh, I've mentioned on this channel many times that I love Henry Bobby Keane I, as an illustrator. I have actually gone out of my way to find books that he's illustrated, even when I don't particularly want the book. That is not true with Cape Cod, with Thoreau's Cape Cod. In this edition, Beston also provides, he provides an introduction, lots of notes, and also a few of uh, Thoreau's other writings on Cape Cod, all in one volume. So this is, this is by, uh, <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> Look at that. Henry David Thoreau. <laughs> uh, this is by Bram Hall House. I don't know that you could search it by that. This is the edition. If you want to look for this, what this is what it looks like. And uh, it's well worth the search if you want the perfect edition of Cape Cod by Henry David Thoreau. So there you go. A totally gratuitous, extra TBR torture. Will Interpol ever stop me? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Would you actually want them to? I'm not sure of that either. <laughs> so we have we have Cape Cod by Henry David Thoreau. We have a paperback version of Sir Philip Sidney, but in this case, I'm mainly just recommending the defense of Posey. Although I'm a big Sidney fan, <laughs> don't get me wrong. We have a self-portrait by Byron, which he unfortunately never wrote, or it, he wrote part of one and it didn't survive. But this is amazing. It is an amazing work of literary reconstruction. Well worth the time and effort to hunt down. And then three mass markets. We have Parish by Mildred Savage, who, who is, alas, uh, no longer with us. Uh, we have Mall Flanders. <laughs> Needs no introduction by me, and yet I gave it one anyway. And we have uh, Nightlife, the first Cal Leandros novel uh, about supernatural hotties fighting their way just to, to make their way in this topsy-turvy world of a supernatural New York. <laughs> so, so there you go. And the fact that a TBR torture can be done on a random selection of books just that happen to ever have been published means that no one is safe. No one. <laughs> but so I'll be back.